Epigraph of this poem is a six line quotation from Canto 27 of the Inferno by the Renaissance Italian poet Dante Alighieri. I will not read that. I will read the one in the part in English, right? So it's the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table, let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question, oh, do not ask. What is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, there will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate, time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I'm formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? 
I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have sneezed, squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor and this and so much more? Is it impossible to say just what I mean? But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves, blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. Friends, just a note of caution before I begin. The voicing you're about to hear would be most accurately described as a sound coming from my imagination rather than being rather than belonging to any specific geographic Caribbean location. <laughs> the dust Edward Kamau Brathwaite. Evening, Miss Evie, Miss Maisie, Miss Maud, Olive, how are you? How are you, Evie, child? You take that miraculous bush for the trouble me tell you about? Hush! 
Don't keep so much noise in the white people shop. But you take it. Every night for her gets into bed. You... <laughs> I bet you're feeling less poorly already. I ain't no pearly man. Anyway, the body ain't dead. No, man, you're looking more hearty. Already? <laughs> then all I can say, and I say it again, you got to thank God for small mercies. Amen, Evie child. Amen, Evie child. And again, I say it's amen. Miss Evie, I want you to trust me half pong at half pong of flour and two cake of soap till Monday come with the will of the Lord. Write two cake of soap and half pong of flour in olive black balance book for me, Maisie, my dear. And olive, don't forget about the biscuit and salt fish your daughter Marilyn come here and said that you wish to take out last month. Monday DV are settling every brass bill and penny that owe in this shop, Miss Olive, my dear. Hey, Mary, you there? I didn't see you there, with your head half hiding in the dark of that crocus bag. How Darrington mule. He's still sicky sicky. And now I hear that the cow gone down to. He didn't give no milk since last Tuesday. Is the pestilence, man. Same kind of sickness like wickedness, man, disfavor the yams. It's true. Bollinger, spinach, with a face cabbage, my Caroline Lee and the six weeks too. Green swivel up and the little blue leaves of the red rock slips getting dry, dry, dry. It's the pestilence, man. Mr. Jiggs said it's a test of the times, like the 1914 and 18 war when they burn out the balls with that yellowing mustard gas. And if you ask me, there's soon going to be fresh wars and rumors of wars. But it's true. It's the pestilence, man. You ain't hear the silence? Pastor said last night in chapel that the writing hand upon the wall. But that isn't all. You remember that story Grand tell us about made us? No. Oh, no, first that. Well, it seemed that they have a mountain near here that always smoking and boiling like when your belly got bad. What are you saying, child? But it's true. Now how you know? Anybody live there? You know anybody from there who live out near here? Besides, where exactly that place is? That isn't your business. Besides, it's miles and miles from the peace of this place. And it's always pouring and pouring out smoke. Some say it's in one of them islands away where the language tie tongue. And to hear them speak so in the St. Lucia Patwa is as if they can't understand a single word of English. But I don't really know, eh? All I know is that one day, suddenly so, this mountain leg of one brog along the whole bloody backside of this hill like it blow off, like the blasting stones in the quarry. Rocks big as your cow pen, hoist in the air as if there was one set of shingles. That noise, Jesus Christ, was a rain down splinter and spark as if it was confederation. But you ain't got to call the Lord name in vain to make me swallow this tale. It is nice, Olive man, it is nice. It is true. And the Lord God know us sorry. But it black, black, black from that mountain back. In your face, in your food, in your eye. In fact, Granny say, in the broad daylight, even the white as the skylight went out. And if you hear people shout, oh, they can't find a way, oh, they isn't have shelter, can't pray to no priest or no leader, and God gone and darkened the day. Grand say that even the fowls in the yard jump back upon their coops when, when the air turned gray and the cocks start to crow as if it was four day morning. It went dark, dark, dark as if it was night. And I frighten, you know, when I hear things so. It's made me wonder and pray. Because I said to myself, Olive child, you just eat and sleep and try to forget the burdens your back got to bear. You just drink, dance, sometimes on a Saturday night, meet your man, and if God bless you, beget. <laughs> you just get up, walk about, 
Praise God that your body ain't turned into stone and that your body is still big. That you got a good voice that can shout for heaven to hear you. Ain't got nothing to fear from no man. You just come to the shop, stop, talk a little bit, get dispatched, and go home. You still got a bat that can dig in the fields and hoe and pull up the weeds from the peony brown square that you call in your own. You ain't sick and your children strong. Every day you see the sun rise, the sun set. God send every month a new moon. Dry season follow wet season again, and the green crop follow the rain. And then suddenly so, without rhyme, without reason, your crops start to die, and you can't even see the sun in the sky. And suddenly so, without rhyme, without reason, all your hope gone. Everything look like it coming out wrong. Why is that? What it mean? Good afternoon, everyone. I think we can dispense with the formalities. Um, Mrs. Hudson has asked me to be brief, <laughs> but that is very difficult when you're introducing someone with our speaker's credentials, but I will, I will try. The first thing I can say about Professor Dawes is that he looks very good for his age, because based on his bio, he has to be at least 107 by my, by my calculation, and I fear that um, my presentation of his accomplishments may be longer than his remarks, so let me see how fast I can go through this. Our distinguished Professor Dawes is the Chancellor Professor of English at the University of Nebraska and the Glenna Lachelle Editor of Prairie Schooner, which is the school's cooperative publication um, between its press and its creative writing program. While the University of Nebraska claims him very proudly. He is universally recognized as one of the leading figures in Caribbean poetry. He was born in Ghana, but spent most of his childhood and adult life here in Jamaica, studying at JC and at UE before going on to the University of New Brunswick. As a poet, as an editor, and as a critic, Kwame is one thing. He is prolific. Over the last 20 years, he has published 18 collections of poetry, numerous plays, 15 of which have been staged, many of them directed by Kwame or starring Kwame, <laughs> um, as well as essays and books covering fiction, nonfiction, and literary criticism. And there is a long list of books which I will not read, but I can direct you to kwamedaws.com for his full collection. Um, I am happy to see that he has also included in his collection a children's book, I Saw Your Face, which is a beautiful celebration of the um, dignity of black children from all over the world. He has written widely on poetry and has edited numerous anthologies, including So Much Things to Say, 100 Calabash Poets, 50 Poets Celebrating Jamaican Independence, and Wheel and Come Again, an anthology of reggae poems, as well as anthologies of African American and black British poetry. His long list of literary awards includes the Forward Poetry Prize for Best First Collection, the Hollis Summers Prize for his book Midland, the Pushcart Prize for his poem Inher Inheritance, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, the Barnes and Noble's Writers for Writers Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Silver Musgrave Medal for his contribution to the arts in Jamaica. This year, he was the Wall Street Journal's Olympic poet, writing verses that capture the spirit of each day's action at the Sochi Olympic Games, from things as minor as wardrobe malfunctions to the appearance of the Jamaican bobsled um, team. On top of all his work as a writer, Kwame is also a musician and, as I mentioned, an actor. He is an Emmy-winning documentary producer for the multimedia site livehopelove.com, based on a project he did at the Pulitzer Center called Hope, Living and Loving with AIDS in Jamaica. Much of Kwame's work celebrates Africa and the African diaspora, and his activism follows suit. In 2012, he established the Africa Poetry Book Fund and Series, which publishes four new books of poetry from Africa each year. 
He is much loved and respected here at home for his dedication to Jamaica and Jamaican literature. He is a very good friend of the National Library of Jamaica, for which we thank him. And of course, he is well known for his outstanding work as one of the founders of the Calabash Literary Festival, which I am happy to say returns this year with an amazing lineup of gifted Jamaican writers and distinguished visitors, including Jamaica Kincaid, Zadie Smith, and yes, you heard right, Salman Rushdie. One of the readings at this year's Calabash will be the Jamaican translation of the American children's book parody, Go the Blank to Sleep, which I had the pleasure of working on with Kwame. The Jamaican translation is called Go the Blank to Sleep. And if you want to know what the blanks are for, I would recommend that you come to Calabash. <laughs> Through his poetry, his writing on poetry, and his work with young poets and writers, and his involvement with Calabash, Kwame's influence is so pervasive that it's not hard to imagine that in a few years, we will all reassemble here to listen to a lecture on the influence of Kwame Dawes on Caribbean poetry. <laughs> Until then, we can continue to enjoy his work, jam with him at Calabash, follow him on Twitter, and listen to him and learn from him today. Kwame, welcome home. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kwame Dawes. Huh. <laughs> that was quite good, I thought. <laughs> um, you can hear me okay? Good, excellent. Um, it's good to be here, This and, and it's really good to see so many of you here. Um, not so good to see people who taught me here, um, <laughs> because now I know they're watching to see what I'm going to say, and it's going to be just as it was when you taught me chaotic, occasionally insightful, but mostly entertaining. So that's what we're going to try and do. Um, the, the, I've been talking a lot about T.S. Eliot um, in, in the States. I've been doing some talks and lectures, particularly about the four quartets. Um, so when Winsome Hudson contacted me and said, look, would you be interested in doing something on Eliot? I said, sure, I could do that. But it seemed... Um, necessary to contextualize it within the Caribbean. And so I began to think about the idea of um, what, what I've called strange bedfellows um, as the context for this talk. Um, so I'm going to give this talk. I'll do mostly reading from about it, and I'll sort of occasionally break off to, to expand on a thought or an idea. Um, but hopefully we'll have some time to have questions afterwards. I think it, it's, it's fair to say that with those two readings, one by... Um, by T.S. Eliot, the, the, the proof of piece, and then, of course, the, the, the dust by um, Kamau Brathwit. Um, we could just have just listened to you know, Eliot and, <laughs> and Brathwit for the day, and that would have been um, pleasurable enough. And I say that slightly um, tongue-in-cheek, but, but with, with, with an, a little bit of sincerity, given two things that have happened to me, or it's really one thing, but they are related to two occasions um, quite recently. Um, I was at, at in Oregon um, in, in January. I teach in a, at, a, at a low residency MFA program called the Pacific University Program, and I teach there ten days a year, at ten days in this winter, and then ten days in the summer. Um, and in the mornings, I go for for, for, for walks, extended walks, and um, and then in the evenings, I'll go for a walk. And one evening, I'm I'm listening to the BBC um, on my thingamajig phone thing, you know plug in your ear thing. And, um, and, and it's BBC Four, and of course, they announced Jeremy Irons is about to read the Four Quartets. Um, and if you haven't heard that recording, it's just a stunning, moving um, uh, reading, uh, very delicately handled and, and very evocative. And it takes you about 40 minutes. So for 40 minutes, I was listening to this, this poetry that harks back to a childhood memory. Um, and so that moment was very important to me and very moving. And then later on, Irons had done a recording of The Wasteland, much shorter, but also quite interesting. Um, so, so, so those two things reminded me of the visceral kind of reaction that I have to, to, to Eliot's work. Um, but it's a troubled reaction. And part of the context of this discussion, um, hopefully, we'll talk about that idea of the troubled nature of it. Um, in many ways, is the title of this talk, which is, you know, Strange Bedfellows, is, um, 
exaggerates the relationship, I, I think, between Elliot and the Caribbean port. Um, frankly, I think they were more troubled bedfellows than, you know, than strange bedfellows. And the trouble was largely on the side of the Caribbean writer. I don't think Eliot cared. Um, but I could be wrong about that. And something else I would say may help us to, to see that in that context. So let me propose that there is some truth to the assertion that, among many things, one of the greatest challenges of the West Indian poet and writer was to evolve a distinctive uh, West Indian poetics as distinct from the poetics of the colonizer, of Britain, of the, 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 that, that, that society that, gave, that educated them. The writers would have worried about their contribution to the literary canon, um, and they, they could only see their way there by way of evolving something that is distinctive or creating a canon space that would be their own. Um, now, first, it may have been a matter of content that was, that was being explored, whether the content was going to be different, then a matter of language and idiom. And these were the ways in which um, this, this, this influence was being challenged. Um, then it could have well been a matter of style. And we could talk a lot about style. And we think of somebody like Kamau Brathwood, and we think of the stylistic questions there. And then it would evolved into an issue of ethos. And, and I think ethos and sensibility are related. And finally, it may have been a matter of aesthetic and tradition. So I have created a kind of line of, of, of progression and, and, and a progression of the relationship between the Caribbean writer and the Caribbean poet and this tradition that, um, in many ways, you could say um, we came out of. Um, now, we can, we can also exaggerate the absence of the literary tradition in the Caribbean. And some of the work of many of our, our thinkers and our writers is to propose that there is a tradition. And if we accept the notion of orature, that is an oral tradition that is also a kind of literary, has a literary kind of validity, um, then we would say they existed something of, of some nature. But, but, but it, 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 it's, it's fanciful to ignore the fact that um, really many of the writers um, of that period, that is the early writers, whether it's Claude McKay, Okay, um, and whether it's the writers that we've come to know and who are still living, people like Walcott and Brathwood, um, it, it would be fanciful to say that they felt happily comfortable with the notion of a Caribbean literary um, uh, tradition that existed. The truth is, I don't think they did. I think um, the images of writing inside a vacuum just keep happening again and again in their work to suggest that they felt that they were creating something, as Kamau Brathwaite says, torn and new. At the same time, there's a negative side or a kind of different perspective of it. It's the, it's the, it's the wonderful um, um, red flag um, or the red you know, thingamajig that bull, 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 bullfighters use um, that, that V.S. Naipaul you know, sort of put out there. And I like to, to quote it out of context um, when he says there's nothing created in the West Indies and so on and so forth. And we all get annoyed and throw stones at him. Um, but it comes out of that, 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 that dilemma and that, that challenge. And so, so I think we should face that. And one of the ways in which we can understand that better is only to compare the, the condition of the current Caribbean poet with that of, say, um, Collymore, Walcott, Brathwood, Lamming, who, who started off as a poet, and people like Claude McKay. The truth is, I do not feel as if I'm writing in a vacuum. And, and I think many of us don't feel that way because we have at least the tradition of some of the people that I've mentioned um, to say, OK, we, we can plant our work inside of that. Um, I just don't think they, they, they had that. And, and also, um, we, we've had the, the comfort of a, a tradition that has been regarded as excellent or of, of great international value, which makes us feel relatively comfortable about not only feeling we're rooted in something, but able to just go and do whatever we want to do um, without feeling as if we are abandoning um, a capacity for, 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 for validity as, as, as writers. Now, I want to suggest that Eliot offered a number of things to the, to the Caribbean writer um, that we may sometimes overlook. Um, and, and I would say that he, the, the, one of the things that is, is very interesting about Eliot, and the reason I suggested the dust, for instance, is Eliot's use of, of something like the vernacular, um, which happens very curiously and very interestingly in the wasteland, um, where he uses the vernacular in what we'd call a kind of heightened way and a very pointed way, um, using the notion of his, his notion of the objective correlative to create in the vernacular, in that conversation, jog, jog, jog jog or hurry up please, it's closing time, those refrains within the, the idea that there's an emotional 
correlative to it. There's a, there's a true emotional correlative to it, but the vernacular becomes the only way to enter into that emotional space and that, that context, that, that, that contemporary context of British society. Now, there are a couple of things we should say very quickly about T.S. Eliot is that Eliot appears in a number of photographs that are related to um, the Caribbean. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting photograph where he appears in a Caribbean Voices studio with some Caribbean people like Lamin and so on and so forth. So Eliot was in that room, um, and, um, and they, they, he was a part of that movement that, that started Caribbean Voices, and he was in those discussions at some time. The other thing is when Eliot became an editor at Faber, he was the editor and actually the, the person who acquired the work of John Hearn. Um, and so, so they, there's, it is not a, a, a kind of distant relationship. Eliot had that kind of interest, and um, writers from the Caribbean had some encounter with T.S. Eliot. Now, I believe it was in fourth form when I first encountered the poetry of T.S. Eliot. The curious thing is that we were not studying T.S. Eliot, that is we at JC at the time. And I was not the kind of precocious child who would pick up a collection of poems by Eliot to edify myself. Um, Eliot came into my house via my sisters. Um, for some reason, they were both, as far as I can recall, studying Eliot's The Four Quartets. And they, they were at, at St. Hugh's. And, and they were... <laughs> All right, uh, let's pause to recognize St. Hughes. In the house. <laughs> so anyway, can I continue? Thank you, all right, good. Um, and so they were cl clearly enjoying it so much that they had committed whole swaths of the poem to memory and found great pleasure in quoting noisily passages by Eliot in our home. They were also studying the thing so that they had to know the lines by heart to be able to quote them and look bright in the exam. Thus, I knew, I knew Eliot by heart before ever reading a single poem by him, time present and time past are both perhaps contained in time future, all time is eternally present, and blah, 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 blah. So we were, they were chanting that, and that was happening in my house, and so on and so forth. Again, please don't mistake my house for some great literary space. We just, <laughs> it's just the way people studied noisily. Um, this declaiming went on for long stretches at the time, and we went through the rose in the rose garden, the still point in the turn world, the dance, and then I was quoting Eliot gleefully, and even today I can quote short passages from poem from memory, a memory formed in my teens. The fact that I met Eliot's work in this way may explain to a, a large part why I had a positive engagement with his work later on in my life. I think people, I've, say, I've said it in a note, is that some people have a very negative relationship with Eliot, hard, difficult, annoying, why do I have to study this? And why I'm never say what I mean? That kind of relationship. But for me, it was sound. I just loved the sound, and I was under no compulsion to understand what the hell he was saying. So that pleasure never left me. But also, the other pleasure is the pleasure of learning something by heart. There is a way in which, if you can learn it by heart and repeat it, the accomplishment of learning it by heart is the pleasure in itself, right? Whether you know what it means or not. Um, so, so I had a positive relationship to his work before I, I had even um, read anything by him. Um, so I was encountering his work as part of an oral performance, and this meant that I was not reading the work, but I was also hearing it and enjoying the language, the rhythms, and the intelligence within it. For me, then, Eliot is ingrained in my idea of poetry and in my engagement with it as a youth, as a young person. And there was something appealing about the easy cadence of the poetry, and I was, lear and I was learning something from that. Of course, Eliot was not the only writer whose work came into our lives because of my sisters and the work they had to study. I mean, I learned, you know, lines from Merchant of Venice um, and Macbeth and so on and so forth, that way too. So, the, so the, you can blame their noisy studying for much of my interest in literature. Um, more often than not, I did not quite grasp the meaning of the passages, but I enjoyed their sound and so on. What remained in the case of Eliot, however, was the conundrum that his line, all time is eternally present, introduced to me, and I think I was wrestling with the meaning of that. Um, I understood this to be a phrase of profundity and wisdom, I, but I did not always understand it, and I enjoyed the sparks of revelation that came from grappling with the idea of time contained within time, this idea of a still point in a turning world, these constructs that appeared throughout, philosophical constructs that appeared throughout the four quarters, that, that 
as you know, I'm a six, 14 year old sort of thinking about what this all means, and and that excited me. Um, it, and and I think one of the most revealing moments for me was when I started to listen to Bob Marley's Kaya and and thought of misty morning, don't see no sun. I know you're out there somewhere having fun. There is one mystery I can't express why you give your more to receive your less. The power of philosophy floats through my head. Light like a feather, heavy as lead. It, this was another conundrum. And I, I put these two things together and I thought, somebody in this equation is very bright. It may be both of them, all right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was a, a, a real revelation for me. So wrestling with conundrums was a pleasure, was, a, was, a, was an exciting thing for me. I didn't have to understand it to be engaged by it. And I, and I, I really sort of recommend that if you, if you are, you are responsible for any young person who is wrestling with, with literature or poetry, assure them that they don't have to understand the thing to enjoy it. They may fail the exam, but that's not the end of the world. <laughs> Just say it. Now, before I came to Jamaica this time, I went to my bookshelves in search of any book or writing that I could find. My books have now merged into one holding with my father's books. And so I have a collection of some variety on my shelf. I came to the ease and began to slip, flip through Eliot's critical essays on writing, on art, and on poetry. He has strong views. His views are quite strong. And he's one who could pontificate with authority, sometimes with annoying authority. Um, you want to, to, to ignore him. Um, or to quarrel with him. Um, and there were volumes of poetry and plays. The output was in terms of volume. Uh, really, Eliot's volume of creative, creative work was fairly, fairly um, modest. Um, and most of the books that, were, uh, that are on the shelf there are, belong to my father. Now, he clearly had read Eliot a lot in the late 40s and certainly in the 50s and throughout his life as a teacher and as a writer. He was not alone in this en engagement with Eliot as a writer. Indeed, one could argue that given Eliot's st status as a poet on the greater part of the 20th century when he was alive, it would have been careless of any aspiring poet not to reckon with Eliot and his ideas. Um, Caribbean writers were often embarked on a peculiar effort to both compete with and outplay their colonial counterparts, as well as to sometimes reject the vestiges of influence that seemed to compromise their capacity to construct a new and distinctive art and sensibility. What complicated Eliot as a figure was that while he was undoubtedly a part of the British colonial establishment, he was himself an outsider. He was an American with what some of his snooty British friends called his desire to be more British than the British. Um, it was a mean and condescending accusation that only a secure British person could make. Um, but it was cruel because there was a hint of truth to it. Eliot, after all, remained fully positioned as a British voice for all of his life. Consequently, his work reveals a complication that would make sense to writers of formerly colonized countries. Pat the pattern of negotiating the sense of entitlement to the British tradition and to the language and the sense of being free to be somewhat different and to be able to write outside that tradition. It's very hard. I mean, the Americans like to argue and sort of point to Eliot's sort of um, East Coast connections and the way that it feeds into his work, answers, and so on. Um, but it's an, an, an effort to reclaim Eliot. Um, Eliot himself did not sort of happily um, position himself as an American voice. Um, he was quite comfortable being a, a British voice. Um, and that, that is a complicated kind of conundrum. And it's an Oxford conundrum. It's a conundrum of, 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 of class, of, of, of um, elitism, uh, uh, amongst other things. But of course, Eliot was not alone, at least in the early days in this circumstance. His countryman, Ezra Pound, also, for his part, found his grounding and playground in the UK, at least in the early years. Indeed, if one were to try to understand the currency of what Harold Bloom, uh, the American uh, critic, coined the anxiety of influence, one only has to look at Pound's 1935 book, The ABC of Reading, and one can sense that his bias is wholly Eurocentric and that he positioned himself at least at the time as part of the lineage of the British imagination, or at least the European imagination. Uh, if you, you know, this is a 
book that you read and and um, and and decide that it's pointless being a writer, um, <laughs> because it says the kind of annoying things like you know, um, and this is Pound's thing, you know, you you know, like you should read, um, you know. Um, Sophocles or somebody like that, but you can't read it in translation, otherwise it's no point. You have to read it in the original language uh, or some obscure Czech writer and you'd say, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense in English. You know, you've got to read the original language. And if you haven't, then, you know, I don't know, you're just, you're, you're out of it. So you read that book and you go, well, what's the point? Like, what am I doing? You know, um, and, and it turns out he was just showing off. And, um, and some of the languages that he claimed that it should be read in, he did not know either. Um, and we know Pound. Pound was very much involved in translating Japanese and, and Chinese poetry. He he didn't know any of those languages. Um, so that was, but but, well, you know. So, um, however, there is a way in which he was enshrining that tradition as the basis for this Western culture, and this was a very powerful thing. And 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 many of that generation, some of you here, were trained in that, in that to learn the Greek and to, to learn, you know, to learn um, the, the Latin and to understand it in that context. So that was the flow and the tremendous benefits to that understanding. But at the same time, there becomes this conflicted sensibility of saying, is this my tradition? And do how do I position myself in that tradition? It's one thing to say it is my tradition. It's another thing for the tradition to say you don't belong to it. So this is this becomes part of the conflicting situation. So it harks back to the British saying Eliot was trying to be more British than the British. Pound himself left England in 1920, but before, by then, he had already sort of edited um, and so-called discovered T.S. Eliot. He edited the, um, four, the um, Prufrock and then, of course, the Four Quartets, um, and had introduced the world to, to Eliot. Um, so I think, though, that one of the things I would like to us to think about is that Eliot's poetry became, for many writers, um, somehow connected with Britain and its education system, and yet engaged in a struggle to break away from the influence of that culture, a pathfinder of sorts. And for the Caribbean writer, I think this is a truth. Truth. It's just a simple truth. If your education is heavily influenced by Britain, um, you, you, your pleasures, your pleasures in language and in literature, come from that tradition. You cannot deny that. You know, the, the, the idea that you're just going to be a revolutionary um, and pretend that you did not love reading Shakespeare and it did not excite you uh, it would have been stupid. Uh, but, 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 but you could be conflicted about loving Shakespeare. And, and I think this was one of the things that Eliot represented was the capacity to love that tradition and yet to feel permission to break from that tradition or to create something new out of that tradition. I think, I think this is, this is the, 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 the key value of, of T.S. Eliot. And, and I, I don't think it's accidental that Eliot was working his way into a tradition after um, a, 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 a sizable American tradition of breaking away from that tradition, from Whitman to, um, to what's her name? Um, you know who I'm talking about, Emily Dickinson, um, Melville, and so on and so forth, consciously breaking away from the British tradition. And, 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 and T.S. Eliot knew that, but he was also sort of working his way back. And by the way, just as an aside, Eliot was not the only one sort of engaged in that discussion in England at the time. I don't know how many of you know that Frost was in England around the same time. And Frost, for instance, that poem, that famous poem, um, The Road Not Taken, you know, that, that famous poem, we, we all assume it's set in New England, for instance. It's a New England um, setting. And so the truth, it was set in England. And it was, a, it was, a, it was actually a poem he wrote for his, his friend, um, I forget the name of the, the poet, who became a, a, a fairly moderate British poet. Um, but they were close friends, and they used to go walking miles and miles and miles and just talking and so on. And then the war broke out and his friend was asking the question, should I enlist or not? Frost left England right away because he didn't want to hang around for a war. So he went back to, he went back to America and he wrote that poem for his friend. And of course, this broke their relationship because his friend read it and said, how dare you trivialize 
this decision I have to make as to whether to sign up for the war or not to sign up for the war. So we, we think of this poem as this iconic moment of Frost talking about an existential choice between this and that. But it was actually a little stab at his friend for keeping harping, harping. I don't know where I should go. Maybe I won't go. I don't know where I should go. Maybe I won't go. And it was a kind of joke poem. But we've come to see it as this iconic poem of decision. But Fro Frost, for instance, was very engaged in that. But he made the decision that he's going to locate himself within the American tradition. This is not a choice that, um, that Eliot would make. Um, so the, the final thing I would like to say at this point is I would like to say is that when I speak of the Caribbean poet, of course I'm speaking of poets um, of, of, of many generations who have been influenced by, by, by Eliot, but in different ways. Um, so the, most of the things that I'll say following this actually refers to poets um, of the period that, that I think we are best known for the emergence of the Caribbean novel. The Caribbean poet doesn't have this kind of moment, you know, the golden moment and so on. It sort of flows along, right? But in the 1950s, the publication of a whole slew of novelists by, you know, Lamming, Mitchell Holzer, um, Selvan, Naipaul, and the, 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 there was a big sort of explosion that happened. The poetry in publishing did not happen in the same way. Um, so, so we really don't see a proliferation of Caribbean poetry being published until the 1990s and 2000s. That's really the, 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 the truth. Before that, it's just scattered pieces of work being published, although the work still existed. So, but it's important to, to recognize that, that Eliot's influence affects the aesthetics and the poetics of even the novelists as well. Um, so many careers were made in that period between 1950 and 1970. Um, and, and some of those writers, I think, are very important here. So, I'm going to suggest that there are six critical areas of influence that are represented in the work of T.S. Eliot. The first, of course, is this idea of the polyglot of allusions, right? The polyglot of allusions really refers primarily to the earlier work, the wasteland, proof rock, and, and so on. Um, and, and in those works, um, what we do see in Eliot is a, a propensity to, 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 to have an explosion of allusions to all kinds of things, first and foremost to, 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 to the to Western canon, and then secondly, and, 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 and I think more interestingly and troublingly in the sense of troubling the, 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 the status quo, to popular culture, to the vernacular, to other, other things. So the, the polyglot of allusion becomes this real um, interesting thing. And, 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 and an, an unwillingness to, to, to answer all the questions about the allusions in the work. This is, this is fairly radical. I think you, you can fairly say that Eliot was writing The Wasteland as a, as a war poet, a poet writing at the wartime. But there, there's a big difference between T.S. Eliot, for instance, and, and Sassoon, or even Owen, right? Because these guys are writing within the contained realm where everything that is to be understood about the poem is almost present in the poem, directly present in the poem. It doesn't demand going elsewhere to try and make sense of it. Whereas Eliot, I think, was, was introduced in a, a broader sense of, 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 of that, that idea. Um, and, and, and of course, his notes tell you a great deal about that. I mean, his notes begin by saying, there's a reason why this is hard. So in case you thought it wasn't, <laughs> he, he then tells you, it's hard. I'm going to, and it's, it's hard, right? So, so he begins by that, and he gives us all these notes about all kinds of things. He just quotes stuff in Italian or in this other language, and you're sitting there, and you don't have Google Translate, and you're really in trouble, right? Um, now you have Google Translate. <laughs> And it works. <laughs> so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is a way, um, he offers a way to love the British and yet feel free to resist or expand on that tradition. I mentioned that earlier, but it's really kind of important. Um, because I think for many writers, this was a dilemma. I don't want to speak of, 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 of writers you know, who can, can, can trouble me now because they are living. So I will, so I will, I will mention the dilemma that I, I believe my father himself faced, um, you know, and I, I, I feel comfortable doing that. I grew up with the man. Because I think my father was this weird contradiction 
not not a not a tragic contradiction, but a very almost amusing and alive contradiction of somebody who was obviously um, an Anglophile. He loved the British language. He loved the poetry. He loved the other thing. And at the same time, he was radically anti-colonial and 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 actually kind of didn't like the British. So so. So, so he had this weird kind of thing where his dream, when he would sit down, he'd say, you know, what is the dream that you have? And he would say, the dream is that we would all, he would retire to Oxford and we would just hang out in Oxford. This was my father's dream. This is the Marxist, you know, like anti-colonial guy. His dream is just to relax at Oxford. Like what? So, so, but, so there's this weird kind of um, contradiction, the passion for it. I mean, he had a first in, in Anglo-Saxon, that's the line in Old English, that's what he, he knew and he knew it well and he loved it, but at the same time, he was willing and desirous of exploring African traditions and voices and so on and trying to make those things work. So, so you, we, I think we see in, in these writers a need to, 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 to celebrate that. And in his work, in his poetry, you see allusions to Eliot, but you see also real, like almost ripping off some but like Dylan Thomas, he just happily, like, you know, the thing sounds like Dylan Thomas because he loved that um, and yet was creating something that was located in, in, in the Caribbean. I think Eliot gave them permission to, to engage the tradition and then to challenge the tradition. Do you, you understand what I mean? To question the tradition and yet to, to be able to see that if this is the tradition that is feeding the work in this polyglot of illusions, then why can't I then explore another set of traditions that can feed the work with their own kind of polyglot of illusions as well? And I think this is one of the, the, the things of permission um, that Eliot um, gives to us. So that's the other thing. The, the, th the third thing is the liberation of fragmentary narratives, images, and allusions to capture the brokenness of the colonial experience and the rupture of the middle passage and the psychic upheaval of history and all of these things. I think that fragmentation as a structure as a, and a way to write um, becomes a, a possibility that Eliot gives, gives these writers. And the fragmentation um, is, 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 for Eliot, was a reflection, a psychic reflection of what was happening in the world in the early 20th century. The demise of, of trust in, in belief systems and religious systems, the horror of, of this, the First World War and the brutality of it and all the deaths that surrounded it and a sense of, of, of disillusionment about it, I never knew death had outdone so many. Um, the, the ability to talk about that, and yet to find that the only language with which to articulate that was a language that was fragmentary, that was broken, that showed the brokenness of the society. Eliot wasn't the only one, of course. Joyce was doing the same thing. Virginia Woolf was doing the same thing. They were writing in that kind of style. And I would argue that somebody who's really not talked about a great deal as a modernist in the United States is Gene Toomer. Gene Toomer is a weird aberration in African-American tradition, which is largely a naturalistic, uh, realistic kind of literary tradition until you get to um, uh, um, Ralph Ellison with the, with, 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 with the Invisible Man. Typically, before that, it's pretty much Dickenesque in its structure, right? Because it's more useful to use that kind of style to argue um, ideology and that kind of thing. But Toomer is writing all this fragmentary stuff in, 18, in 1918. And it's clearly somebody who would have been reading um, the work, you know, the, the work published in, in the early poetry, um, and Marianne Moore's work and so on, and of course T.S. Eliot's work. So fragmentation becomes a useful tool for the, for the Caribbean um, poet. And we see that, of course, in somebody like Brathwit, and then, of course, later in Tony McNeil. And to some extent, even you see it in, in, in Walcott, who we'll talk a little bit about, because Walcott's fragmentary movements really take place in another life. That's when he sort of goes to town on it, and then he finds his way back to another kind of quiet that we see in the last works, his most recent works, which remind us a lot of um, the four quartets. The other thing is the use of multiple voices, persona of varied worlds and tones. Now this is, this is, this is definitely, I'm talking about the wasteland, right? In the wasteland, 
they're just multiple voices that emerge out of nowhere. This is this is becomes very exciting. It becomes exciting to our, our our poets because the idea is that now the voices can do a range of things. We can use the vernacular. We can use standard English. We can we can compare things and so on. And and that becomes a, an interesting attraction. Um, Kamal Brathwaite's the, the arrivals is a, is a, is a perfect replication of that. And I think Brathwaite treats the arrivals as a dialogue with. With, 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 with the wasteland in some ways and with Eliot's work, with his preludes and his counter preludes and that kind of thing, okay? Um, but the other thing that Eliot gives us in all of this madness and in all of this freedom is the authority of the author, right? So Eliot is not giving up the authority of the author. El Eliot, does, Eliot still speaks of the authority of the author, the, the sort of manipulative control of the author. And one of the things about our poetics, at least in the early days, is uh, it was committed to the idea of the authority, the positioning of the author as, 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 as a lyric kind of presence um, that we can say that is the author's voice rather than something distant from it. So, so, he, so he allows fragmentation, he allows this kind of breaking up of, of the steady, yet at the same time maintaining this kind of authorial voice. There are negative sides to it, of course, because what happens is that when we when we use the, when we have the, the 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 introduction of the vernacular and so on in our tradition, what has happened is that much of that vernacular was used, you know, for minstrelsy, for comic effect, rather than for narrative authority. Right, and and you see that in in a, in a number of those works that were whole novels, for instance, written in the dialect, they were written as character rather than 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 sort of authorial. Once we go to the authorial, we we return to standard English. That's 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 that was our pattern. That was that's the pattern of Miss Lou, right? You know, Miss Lou would talk patwa, and then she will explain that that is the language of the Jamaican people, and then she will go blah 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 blah, blah in patwa, and then she come back again and say. And explain and, and talk. so the authority remains right as a kind of English in standard English. And I think what we are seeing in the contemporary space is writers sort of breaking that tradition and creating an authoritative voice in the dialect. But it takes time, all right? Okay, because we've been trained that standard English is the way to, to sound like you're in charge, like my lecture right now. <laughs> And then the final thing is, um, the, 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 this is a simple thing, but it's really important because the impulse to write a discourse for a rapidly and radically changing world order. This, this idea of the 20th century's upheaval, what we could see was it's almost like somebody crashed the gate and we all rushed in. You understand what I mean? It's like the gate crashed, now we all go in because we're waiting for the gate to fall, right? So there's a way in which this rapidly changing world order then introduces the idea that we can see some change. Politically, this is how it worked. Politically, the British Empire begins to lose its grounding and everybody they begins to see the opportunity to have a new kind of nationalism and to articulate it. And I think in literature, Eliot begins to break down some of these things. Is Eliot doing this willfully or in, in order to open up the world to literature? I can't say that he was. And Eliot's demeanor and his, his, his pontifications did not seem to be about that, right? Um, Eliot was always still talking about the, 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 the tradition, the importance of the iambic, its control and its role in the, in the poetics that he was about. But we could see that inside the work, there's that conflicted sense. And, and we see that being a kind of fissure that, that attracts the, 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 the Caribbean writer. Now, if we think of, um, if we think of the, the other kinds of influences that I think would be important to the Caribbean writer, we, it helps us to put Eliot in, 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 the, in the right kind of context. Of course, some of the writers would include people like James Joyce, um, somebody like um, uh, Yeats, um, and, and Yeats for very different reasons, of course, because Yeats is interesting because Yeats introduces the idea that there's a, the idea of creating a tradition or sort of 
re, sort of re, re, rebirthing a tradition to be the counter tradition to the British tradition. And, and therefore, he embarks on a whole exercise of, of, of celebrating the mythic traditions of Irish society and saying, I'm going to use those as the basis for my sort of literary exploits and so on. He's not rigidly locked in that, but it's very important to him. Um, we see this in Nicolas Guillen in, Cu in, in Cuba when he, he, he em embraces African, tr African traditions and, and tries to use those to create a new kind of aesthetic um, for, 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 for Afro-Caribbean um, um, poetics or Afro-Cuban poetics. And we see this also in somebody like um, Langston Hughes, the amazing Langston Hughes in, in his wonderful essay, The Negro Artist on the Racial Mountain. He proposes that there is a tradition, and it's not a literary tradition, but it's a musical tradition. It's a, it's a cultural tradition that gives authority to the new voices that are emerging um, there. And, and all our writers were not unaware of these things. I mean, Brathwaite talking about jazz in the West Indian novel is a reaching for a pattern of poetics that he could say is not Eurocentric, but comes from the African diaspora. Right? And it would become eventually um, things like talk, it become things like reggae, ska, and so on and so forth, because the quest is to find a grounding that will, will then allow um, for the emergence of this new poetry. Poetics. But the framework of that poetics is still within the structure of, of this, this interesting thing that Eliot establishes, is what, 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 what I'm proposing. Now, for many, Eliot ap appealed because um, the model was not prescriptive. Right? In other words, Eliot's, Eliot's ideas, apart from his whole business of the objective correlative and his, his declaration, for instance, that, um, that Hamlet was a failure, right? <laughs> um, Eliot just said, yeah, Hamlet, Hamlet failed. Shakespeare just really messed up on that one. And, and of course, Eliot's, Eliot's point about Hamlet was that Hamlet's actions, you know, his emotions far outweighed the, the action. You know, as he said, the action of the play did not justify the kind of emotion that was being expected of, 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 of Hamlet. And, and this is where he, he comes up with this idea of the objective correlative, that there should be a direct relationship between these two things. Um, so Eliot made these things, but he was rarely sort of prescriptive. And that absence of prescription um, and absence of a kind of school of following, at least within the Caribbean, helped write Caribbean writers, I think, to do the work that they needed to do. Um, the other thing is, the, the, there is a sense in which um, the, the permission, the authority that Eliot grants to the use of allusions without having to explain allusions is a very attractive thing um, for the new writers that are emerging in the Caribbean, right? Because now, their allusions are harking back to their landscape and to their space and so on. And the idea of writing that space anew um, becomes really important. And, and I think it becomes one of the strengths of the emerging Caribbean voices and the Caribbean writing. Now, I, I want to go to an interesting passage. Um, um, Wayne Brown did a, uh, wrote an essay some years ago um, where he, it, was, it was published in Area, where he, 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 he d declares that he discovers while he's reading um, Sam Selvan's Lonely Londoners this, this fascinating passage um, um, that, that alludes you know, quite directly to, 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 um, to the wasteland, right? And, and I, was, I, find, I find that interesting because of when Wayne Brown sort of, but anyway, I'll read, I'll read this passage. But it's a beautiful way to elucidate, um, and I think Brown does it brilliantly, to elucidate the way in which uh, Eliot is influencing and shaping the, the, the Caribbean writer um, in very direct ways. This is what Br Wayne Brown says. I'm just going in the middle of the essay. It says, it took his death, namely Sam Selvan's death, and perhaps also the pastoral setting of Virginia, not unlike the Trinidad he grew up in, where I reread Ways of Sunlight and The Lonely Londoners after many years. Now, so I don't know when Sam Selvan died, but I think he died in the 80s, right? It was about or early 90s, right? So, so in, in a sense, this is, this is pretty re fairly recent that Wayne Brown is, is saying this. Um, for the deep sensibility of holding those books to break surface for me, and then I was startled to find myself squarely and seriously in the country of T.S. Eliot. The Eliot, a kissing cousin of D.H. Lawrence's, after all, who harks back, to, back in bereavement and bitterness to the romantics. And, and, and here I would just like to credit um, my teachers at, at UWE uh, because 
they pointed this out to us while we were <laughs> studying at UWE. So it wasn't a great discovery to us, right? Um, but but it, it's, it's an interesting discovery because when you see it happening, and if you know Elliot, you go, wow, what is Selvan doing? And, and, and Wayne Brown analyzes it very, very, you know, very, very clearly and beautifully. So what he does is he shows us the Elliot line, and then he shows us the Sam Selvan line. And this is in a novel, right? So this is the Elliot line. On real city, under the brown fog, of a winter dawn. Selvan, one grim winter evening when it had a kind of unrealness about London with a fog sleeping restlessly over the city. Not bad. <laughs> okay, then Elliot, there I saw one I knew and stopped him crying. Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Malay, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Selvan. And sometimes they might spot somebody they know. Hey, Watson, what the hell you doing in Brit, boy? Why you didn't write me you was coming? And they would start big old talk, finding out what happening. Elliot, there'll be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There'll be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands. This is from Alfred Prufrock. Selvan, there is a face you have for sitting at home and talking. There's a face you have for working in the office. There's a face, a bearing, a demeanor for each time and place. There's above all a face for traveling. And that's from a short story called My Girl. And here's what he does with the, this, this great passage in the wasteland, Eliot. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. But, as my, but at my back, in a cold blast I hear the rattle of the bones and the chuckle spread from air to air. That's from the wasteland. And of course, Selvan's line is very simple. And old Moses standing on the banks of the Thames. Now this, but, but there's a passage in, the, in, in Lonely Londoners that alludes to that at my back, I'll always hear Time's winged chariot drawing near, which Eliot uses a couple of times in the wasteland. Um, but it's clear that what, 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 when you read, you know, you're thinking you're into a joke time with, with Lonely Londoners. But what, 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 what Selvan did so beautifully was colonize London, right? And he colonized the language of London. He colonized the poet of London. He colonized that space with his own rendering of, of, of that space by alluding to it. But not only that, but imitating and so on. The other thing that we see there is that it's not merely a linguistic exercise. It's an exercise of a shifting ethos and attitudes, right? Um, the, the dialogue with Stetson and so on and so forth becomes something else. It becomes a question of, of, of identifying with somebody else because that becomes the, the, the overarching theme of these, these people living in London, trying to find who they are and trying to find their identity and trying to find their place. Um, the, 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 what, I, what I did not do, which I could have done, and that would have been in itself a kind of exercise, um, was to just then start to list all the ways in which we see you know, the Caribbean writer referencing Eliot and then finding ways to parallel it and so on as an example like that. Um, and I, I, I won't do that um, here because I think that's, that's a bit, it, it's a little too obvious that this was happening. Um, but what I want to sort of draw the last bit of attention to, and then we can have some discussion amongst ourselves. What I want to sort of draw the last bit of attention to, and then we can have some discussion amongst ourselves, um, it, it is this, that the, the, 
that, that what I think we see in the, in the, in the Caribbean port because of, 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 of Elliot's work is, is a way of, of, of constructing a new sensibility, a sensibility that, 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 that the writer could feel that they have ownership of. But to do this with not just authority, but with the bigness of the palette, the, the, the sort of broader palette, I think is one of the great um, opportunities that, that the Caribbean writer had. Now, I don't want anybody to, to leave with the impression that Eliot was the only one influencing in that way. I mean, there's, you could not get Kamau Brathwood or Derek Walker without somebody like Césaire. I mean, they read this guy, and Césaire had already sort of, in his career, had sort of explored the idea of telling this long island narrative and then recreating it in the, in the work that is there. But in a sense, being in dialogue with, with somebody like T.S. Eliot um, also gave a context for the British critics and for the critics around the world for people to read writers who were engaged in a new kind of ethos, a new kind of spiritual conception. The Wasteland is fascinating because this is the last sort of crucial thing that, we, that is worth paying attention to. Um, the Wasteland is interesting and so is Four Quartets because of course in Eliot we have a strong spirituality and, and I use that word um, fully aware of its, its, its slipperiness. But, but he's interested in spirituality and by, by the time we get to Four Quartets we can safely say he's interested in Christianity um, and in Christian ideas and Christian ethos. Um, but in the Wasteland you know that passage, that, that, that great passage where it's almost a reference to the road to Emmaus, right? Um, I saw the man with the brown hood the hooded, the brown hood walking beside you, who was the man, and so on and so forth. And it's clearly a reference to the recognition, recognition of the resurrected Christ and, and the conversations that happened there. And of course, how does the wasteland end? The wasteland ends with the shanty. The wasteland ends with the, 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 the not casual um, allusion to, to, to Indian mythos and Indian, Indian uh, belief systems and so on. And Eliot sort of declares that this is the healing that, that, that the society needs. It needs the blessing of an Eastern kind of belief system um, to, to, to transform this Western society. So Eliot was, was happy to, to, to expand the, the, the sort of spiritual palette um, in, 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 writing, in writing this poem, um, and, and therefore allowing for the possibility of creating a new kind of spiritual palette for the work. Now, Eliot obviously did not entirely abandon the, 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 the Indian myth, mythos or, or, or some of the elements of Buddhism, but by the time we get to the four quartets, it is the still point in the turning world. It is the Christ. It is the Christian idea. It is Paul. It is all of these people that he's wrestling with. It is the resignation of, um, you know, all, you know, you know, the rest, you know, we, you know, all there is is trying. The rest, you know, we can do nothing about. That kind of resignation is the resignation that lets you settle in in the idea of a, a kind of spiritual space. But what that does, though, is that Eliot is able to write this whole four quartets that is obviously a religious poem in the tradition of the the of of, of Hopkins, and we go back to people like Don and so on. And, and yet what we see somebody like Kamal Brathwaite doing is that he creates this new religious poem. And what does he put at the center of the arrivance but, but, but masks, all right? And then masks, we get all the elements. We get even echoes, right? You know, Eliot talks about the rooster crowing in the wasteland, right? The, the, the cock, 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 crow, cock, 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 crow. There's that reference. Well, you hear in mask, cock, 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 and the rooster crows. I mean, what I'm saying is that if I start doing line by line what these guys are doing, we could go on forever. But what, what the point of that exercise is that what Kamal Brathwaite is then introduced in is a new kind of spiritual ethos that says, I'm referencing it within the context of the African tradition and saying that is the ethos that we're going to use to create this new tradition, this new and torn tradition. And, 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 and it is not all lockstep, right? But what is lockstep in the pattern of the Caribbean writer is to see in their own landscape a new place upon which to build a poetic a new place upon which to build um, a, a narrative. And I think Eliot gives permission to the writer to do that, but also excites the writer about doing that by the, the quality and the power and the grace of the work. Any reading of Eliot's biography, if you saw the film, what is it called? Um, something in Tom, Tom, and, Tom and Viv. Not a nice guy generally speaking, right? You know, he, 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 he was problematic, right? Um, and, and Eliot's, sort of, Eliot's legacy is sometimes not an attractive one to some people, right? 
But I think, I think if, you, if you think of just the work itself and you start paying attention to the work itself, you can see what the attraction of Eliot's language is and what its music is. And I think it's especially attractive to, 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 the, to the, the Caribbean voice because of the possibilities that are inherent in it, because of the play that can happen in it, because, and I think this is really important, of the introduction of the popular culture, the introduction of the language of the street, and the, the willingness to use that language and say that is valid for a poetic articulation right, of the highest order. And, and that becomes very attractive and that becomes very appealing and so on, right? So I'm going to make one last statement and then we can have some discussion, right? Um, it would seem to me that what these earlier Caribbean writers found in Eliot was a pattern of examining the complexity of cultural influence. Caribbean writers were English speakers and they did not have the distance, distance and cultural confidence to evoke their own languages and their own histories in ways that would challenge the colonial influence. Now, if you're an African writer and you had Yoruba or Igbo or, or Kikuyu or whatever language, you did not have to wrestle with the idea of whose language is it. Although they did to some extent, right? The big argument between um, Chinua Achebe um, and Ngugi Wa Thiongo. Ngugi Wa Thiongo says, you know, English is a, is a, is a colonial language, um, and we, I will only write in Kikuyu. And Achebe says English is a Nigerian language, right? So they have this big debate. Um, what, is, what is happening is that <laughs> they have to defend a position, right? I mean, what is Achebe going to do? You know, he says, I'm, I'm not writing in Igbo, you know, I'm going to write in, in, in English. Uh, and you know, I'm making a lot of money sort of selling that book, um, so I, I can't stop. But he says it's, it's actually a, a Nigerian language. But we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have that, we, we, we are dealing with English, right? So then what do we do with this English becomes the real question. And, and of course, I'm saying part of the attraction of Eliot is it gives us a way to, to deal with the idea of, of an Englishness that is not English, right? Um, indeed, the idea of being grafted into the British canon because became an unspoken objective, um, uh, unspoken because of its betrayal of a new nationalism that was inherent in the experience of even the most anglophilic writer who may have had issues with being West Indian. If Caliban became the prototype of the Caribbean writer, he did so because he was in many ways the Eliotesque figure who, having mastered the language, managed to usurp that language and use it to his own ends. Eliot cannot have been said to have gone that far. Eliot's nationalistic impulses did not invoke the celebration of his Americanness, but what he offered to the West Indian writer was a way to approach the pleasure and the passion for the canonic British literature and to then be able to defy that canon by its use to ends that satisfy the writer's impulse for a kind of anti-colonial resistance. There are genuine virtues of Eliot, the music, the complex images, the frank lyricism in which the eye intrudes on the seemingly objective voice, the self-reflective engagement with the question of art and much else. Eliot did it well and did it in a way that opened the way for other kinds of experimentations. And in a sense, I think that, that, that for a poet gives you a sense of possibility. Um, but it also challenges you to find what your own poetics will be, what your own context will be. So let me stop there and we could have some questions and so on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Thoughts? What you thought about Eliot's anti Semitism? Yes. Because Bloom uh, doesn't like him very much because no. of that, obviously, since yeah. Bloom is a Jew. Is a Jew, yeah. yeah. Um, this, is, this is a very interesting question because, of course, it, 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 Bloom is a sort of a, it's not an equal opportunity. I mean, he, 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 he's happy with Auden, you know. Um, uh, and Auden was not unproblematic. Um, he really adores Stevens, and Stevens had made comments that were racially very problematic. Um, I think I think we see. I think it's fair. It's a fair criticism of Eliot, um, the Phoenician sailor. The, those references um, are, are, are anti-Semitic, and um, and and it, it didn't help that Eliot then becomes sort of holy Christian um, in in something like the Four Quartets. Um, so, so it does raise the question of what do we do with a figure? In other words, what do we do with a writer 
Um, when it, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that that contained his entire oeuvre, right? You know, this was not the entire body of his work. Um, but it has been possible for people to trace um, the, 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 the line of and the consistency of this anti-Semitic accusation. And, and of course, um, his use of nigger, uh, you know, in other, in other works and so on. Um, so, so, but, 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 but to deal with two parts of that question, Bloom's criticism, I don't take that seriously because Bloom picks and chooses. Um, and and, and on, the, on the other hand, I think it's a worthwhile way to challenge or to question the content and, and intent of some of Eliot's um, articulations uh, um, in the way that I'm, I'm happy to do so with Pound, um, with, uh, with Auden, um, and, 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 and even Frost. I don't know if you know Frost's um, work about Native Americans and, and, I mean, really, like, really problematic. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe somebody will one day find me to be, like, Anti something in my work, and 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 then you will all hate me at that point. Uh, so 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 it's it's a tricky it's a tricky question, isn't it? That's the what one of our challenges. Um, do we do we expect, um, you know, um, Achebe called called um, uh, um, Joseph Conrad, uh, you know, thoroughgoing racist, and says we can't take any of Conrad seriously because of Heart of Darkness, and it's a compelling argument, but at the same time. It seems a little sort of thorough in, it, in its accusation, um, given, of course, Conrad's own problematic experience as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an alien in a, in, a, in, a, in a new language, in a new society, um, and, and his sympathetic attitudes in things like Lord Jim that are not consistent with what we see in, in something like um, um, The Heart of Darkness. Um, so, so I, I don't have an easy answer to that question, but I think it's, it's constantly one that that that, that would, would 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 harass all of us. Um, uh, we 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 must be aware. I think writers have to be aware of the the <laughs> the pitfalls of our current society, but you cannot be aware of the pitfalls of the future society. So, you just have to do your best. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. The um, children who are entering the drama festival, mm -hmm. uh, one choir from St. Hugh's, applause. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't were, encourage them. Were not, <laughs> <laughs> they were not allowed to participate mm -hmm. because that choir of young Jamaicans prepared a presentation which mixed standard English with dialect. There was no category in Jamaica last week of festival for this. And I'm very concerned about this richness and the explosions mm. in poetry. Mm. Those books listed mm -hmm. there in today's Jamaica with the access to the kids across mm -hmm. the road in the junior center. Mm -hmm. And I'm doubly worried because people tell me nobody's reading a book in a book, a hardcover, well, not Nobody, many people, mm. are young, bright kids who speak Patois, mm -hmm. are reading on a nook, a Kindle, mm. their iPhone. Mm. How do we tell them of the richness at home, the hidden yeah. treasures on the foot? Well, that means we need to publish in nook, Kindle, and um, you know, there's no question about it. I, I you know, I. A couple of things I would say to that. I am fascinated that there would have to be a category. <laughs> no, but it doesn't need to be a category. I don't know why, why we even want to have a category. It should be for any... You know, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying that why would we have a category that says this is dialect, you know, speech? Yeah, this is unfortunate. And I will say that categorically and happily. It is unfortunate and it's a misguided idea. Because all it does is it perpetuates the idea that this is a sort of distinctive thing. The truth is that language is language and we should explore it and make it up. Because somebody can write, can win. In other words, you can't win a poem by Miss Lou unless it's in the dialect category. That don't make no sense to me. 
You understand what I'm saying? That poem should sit beside T.S. Eliot. It should sit, and we should compare the two of them and see, and other three of them, and see what makes them validity poetic and so on. So in a sense, I agree with you. The anxiety about reading is, is, is something I don't, I don't worry as much about based on my experience with something like Calabash, right? Because Calabash, okay, a lot of profilers come to Calabash. We'd admit that, right? People who just come for us, profile. Um, <laughs> We welcome you all. Profiling is fine, <laughs> right? Um, but what we do know is that the numbers of books sold at that festival is incredibly insane. Now, that means that, means that people are buying these books to read. So the other thing is we need to get with the program. I, you know, if, 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 if we need to get books out on Kindle, we need to get books out on, on, for those devices, there is absolutely nothing wrong with reading from those devices. I know the library don't like me when I say that, but I know, I know we've talked about it. We don't have a problem with that. Rise up librarians and just support I and I. No, it's true because they're reading. I mean, you know, so we need to find a way to, but we are doing it, right? We're doing it, but it's, it's, it's something that we, we have to find ways to do. This, this series that I started, African Poetry Book um, Fund, one of the things that we've made a deal with, with Open, Open Roads, which is an all online, on digital um, publisher, um, and they, what we're going to do is for every book that we publish, we're going to have it digitally done. And one of the works that is tough for poetry, by the way, because poetry is hard to do the formatting for, for phone and for, for these things. But for prose, there's no excuse, right? And what we're trying to do in Africa is we're trying to find ways to get the regular phones, like the, like the simple Nokia, to be able to, to download passages of, you know, like whole novels without having to have a smartphone to do it. Now, People will, people will read what we can make, you know, there's, there's, if, if, if the problem we face here is sometimes, for a long time, the only experience people had with Caribbean writing or West Indian writing was in school. So after they left school, they say, oh, I'm done with school reading now, right? And I'll read something from outside. Now we have to restore the idea that those writers, you know, Mays and these guys, were not writing for us to read in school. They were writing for people to read popularly. Just read a book and so on. And so that one of the passions we have as a festival, for instance, at Calabash is to encourage that new engagement with the books for the sake of just being books to be read. So, so I think there's place for it. And I, you know, I just thought about, about, um, about six months ago about f f 300 or 400 um, six formers and, 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 and um, Jamaican six formers all day doing workshops with them on writing and so on and so forth. And listen. With a, with a little throw in a few, they, they started to say, where can I get that book? Where can I read that book? And they will, they will do it. You just have to know, you have to get the opportunity. To, you know, you can see something about my attitude. When I see a problem, I don't go, oh, woe is me. I, I go, okay, what are we going to do about this now? Because there's something that can be done. Because what you describe is actually necessary. It's a, it's a gap that has to be filled. But I think it can be done. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, giving up on that one at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we won't do that. <laughs> but you can do a kids' festival. We know we, we know we do what we do, and we do it well. We don't do kids very well, so we won't try it. You, you understand what I'm saying? So somebody else should do it, right? And, and should do it and do it well. Because, you know, when you bring a whole bunch of kids to a place, <laughs> you have to have insurance. <laughs> You have to make sure that them don't drown. You know, what if I, we can't, we can't do that. My picnic, them grow up. I'm done with that. Yes. So, but I'm not saying it's not necessary, right? But it can be done, and somebody has to do it. That's all I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Every year, Calabash brings out uh, a, a West Indian or Jamaican author mm -hmm. that had um, sort of been out of print for a long time. Mm -hmm. You're talking about electronic um, presentation now. Would Calabas start to think about bringing out whatever author they hark back to in um, in electronic um, format? So you could get it on Kindle or whatever. Yeah, what we do is we broker for those things. We are not publishers. Calabas is not a publisher, and we won't start doing that. 
but we'll broker with the publishers. For instance, what we did with um, the Roger Mays book, we worked with Mac Macmillan and asked them to, to republish it, and I wrote the introduction for it. And they, we, then we can encourage them to do a Kindle version and so on. What we did with, um, with we've done with another, with People Tree Press and so on. So we broker, that's what we do. If, because listen, listen, if we go to a publisher and say 2,000 people are going to come to a reading, of this thing, and our record has been that at that event we can sell at least 50 to 100 to 300 copies of the book. They'll pub, they'll republish it. They they they're not they they will do it. You see, so we can broker for those kinds of things. This year we didn't have to do that because we're doing um, uh, uh, Wilson Harris's um, Heartland, which 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 with People Tree had already published, and so that's the one that we are celebrating. It's 50 years of that publication, but we hope it boosts interest in the reading of Harris, who I think is a, is a writer that has hasn't been read enough um, lately. Yeah, brilliant writer. So, so we hope to do that, um, and we'll do that every 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 incarnation of the festival. Yeah. Um, yes, Mr. Dawes. Yes. As a foreigner who has been here many, many, many years, and, and chats with a bit of patois and a bit of English with my patients, I was interested in you doing the whole talk in in, in English, as you pointed out. I was interested in you talking about um, Eliot's use of vernacular, mostly for. Emotion. Now, I chat in Patois when I start getting emotional and I speak English when I want to be serious and make people think I know something. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love you to comment on why you gave the, this lecture in English and how Patois, the various Patois and vernaculars, help us express emotion better than English. Um, first of all, the, the, to go back to your, your suggestion, I, d I don't think that what we see in Eliot is the use of the, the dialect for emotion. I think we use the, the, I think it's more fair to say that you could argue, argue that he uses the dialect for um, what we call local color, you know, um, that kind of thing. Because um, the hurry up please, it's closing time, the, you know, Michelangelo, you know, the, the, the ladies and the, what is it, ladies come and go talking of Michelangelo and so on. And then, and then the, the little conversation about um, the pregnancy and the abortion and so on and so forth. But it's not emotional. It's actually pretty calculated, cold and flat. Um, but it is, it is accurate to, to, to this moment in the bar. And it's capturing a moment and treating it as validly. And then, you know, it's interesting because he places that against the kind of sordid description of, the, of Lester and what's her face, sort of um, their sexual um, mess that is going on. And they both, you know, this is, this is the upper class and they're doing jug, jug, jug. And this is the lower class doing this. So Elliot is doing something quite interesting about class dynamics. And I don't think he's just using dialogue. I think. I, I don't even think at all he's using it for emotion. I, I don't even think the Caribbean writer who uses dialect is using it just for emotion. I think emotion is probably not the, 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 the intention. But it's used to, to create a sense of place. The problem, of course, is that the language, the authoritative language of English is, is part of the way that we've been really educated and, 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 and indoctrinated in our society. Now, I suspect that this lecture could have been done in Patwa, um, but it would be hard work for me um, to do that. Um, not, not, and, and it may be even harder for you to do it. But I, I'm not saying that as an excuse that it shouldn't be done. But keep in mind one of the things that, that one of the great advocates of, of using a language um, that is not necessarily as accessible, um, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not as simple as just doing it. Um, Ngugi Wathiongo, who, who I, I, I met, who is going to be at Calabash this year, by the way. So, so Ngugi Wathiongo I met in 1986 in, in, in Iowa. Um, I was about two years old at the time, and um, a, a, a very, very bright two-year-old. Anyway, so 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 Ngugi made an announcement at that at that. This was in Iowa when I was in the International Writers Program, and he said he's no longer going to 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 to, to write um, novels, lectures, essays, or anything in English. He's going to write only in Kikuyu and have that work translated into English and so on. And he managed to do that for about two years. And then um, his regular translator sort of fell away. So th he didn't have that translator and so on. Do you know that it took maybe another eight years before his first book that was written in that in Kikuyu was published, which was um, uh, Matagari, right? Which is a beautiful book. 
And then it took another 12 years before his last book was published, right, which he, which he said. But then he said he had to fob it because he had to do the translation himself. But also his essays, he said he stopped doing essays in, in Kikuyu and he's going to go back to English because the presses won't translate it and he has to get the work out there. So, so it's a challenging thing and there's a cost for it. Um, and I think that we can create the infrastructure to be able to use it. But let's always remember that that writers are writing for an audience, and, and there, there are challenges to writing for a smaller audience um, that will understand it. And the last thing I would say is that we, you, know, you do something in the language, you have to teach people to read that language. Patwa is not easy to read. <laughs> it's not. It's not, you can hear it orally, but to read it on the page, there's a strong difference in that, in that relationship. Not impossible, but it takes work. And as Carolyn Cooper always says, do the work, right? And she insists on it. And I agree with Carolyn, but, but let's not underestimate the task involved in doing it and the implications in doing it, all right? And, and, and for my part, um, probably if I was living here, I might, I might, you know, and Carolyn was hitting me on my head, I might do it in, in Patwa, but I don't live here, so. Um, I have to go back and talk to the white people also, so um, I need to do that in standard English or in, in Midwestern English. When you talk about Eliot encouraging or giving permission for writers to write in um, their, their language, mm -hmm. dialect or whatever, and to celebrate the local landscape, is that taking away from writers like Claude McClay, those earlier writers who were doing that long before? No, it, it doesn't do that at all, because I think, but remember, you, 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 you said Claude McKay, and then you said those earlier writers. It's not, it's not, it's not like a whole army of them. <laughs> okay. I mean, we always come back to say Claude McKay and them, and you say, well, who them was, right? You know, you, when I was, was in this generation, when I was in the, in, the, in the Walcott and so on generation, but that generation, you know, we're talking about Tom Redcomb and them guys, and them guys that were not going anywhere near dialect. So don't, like, no, 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 not, only in the way that is, is almost, like, sometimes offensive and patronizing. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, know, you, you read some of it and you realize it. Listen, this is one of the great struggles of the early 20th century, not just in, in, in Jamaica, I mean, Constable Ballard's was a very interesting exercise, but he was doing it at the same time that, um, that um, what's his name? I know the, where, where the cage bird sings. Um, Paul, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, not Maya. Maya. Maya was quoting Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar is an interesting case, a brilliant poet in the Georgian style. There are very few poets writing in the Georgian style in the world at that time who were scanning, were writing words with meter, with rhyme, with sophistication, with a syntax that was just the smoothest and most interesting thing and so on and so forth, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar. This is, this is the late 1800s and the early 19th century. What happened with Paul Lawrence Dunbar is that they only wanted to listen to his dialect poems. And this was bothering him because he said, he said, but I write really great poetry in the, in the sort of Eurocentric tradition, but I don't get any attention for it. And, and so all I get is the dialect poems. And what were the dialect poems? They're all comic poems, right? And they were all sort of minstrel-like kinds of poems. And occasionally he would write some poems that were more serious in theme in the dialect, um, but it was conflicting for him. Paul Lawrence Dunbar actually drank himself to death because of an anxiety about that issue. So, so I agree that there are writers who are doing this kind of work beforehand, but, but, but it is clear that I use the word permission because permission means that that language that Eliot introduces is now being published where the publishers are. So the writers who are from the Caribbean can then say, I can go to where the publishers are, that Eliot has been, and, and talk to them about the same thing, right? Um, because, because we know McKay's work because of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, because of, 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 of Langston Hughes using the dialect, because there were publishers interested in that kind of um, sort of native culture, black native culture.
with all the problems that surrounded it. So, so and, and, and again, let me ask you, you know, do we, wh what do we remember? At the end of the day, we still come back to Claude McKay's standard English word, don't we? Celebrating yeah. Local oh no, no, I I agree with that, but I'd even and I think that is true. And, and but what I'm saying is, I'm talking about the the permission that is the mechanism. Y you know, writers can feel it's okay to write about their own space, um, but if they do not feel that that is going to have currency or be accepted for publication and so on, they are in a troubled position, right? I'm just saying this is as a as a reality, even to this day. Yeah, even to this day. So, so I think I think I think there's, a, there's clearly a long tradition of that. And you know, I make jokes about Redcom and these guys, and but they were writing. They set a standard of at least painting the landscape. They did. I mean, you know, the, the White Witch of Rose Hall is a fascinating. At least you see the trees, you recognize. You understand what I mean? The language of the trees and so on and so forth. But but it, there's but we see the work becoming more sophisticated and more confident as as we go along. Now you read somebody like Kai Miller, and you realize that something really remarkable has happened, right? Kai is doing something quite remarkable. Um, Aisha and Hutchinson, these guys are, are writing in ways that are really sort of, they, 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 don't have, they don't have any anxiety anymore. They don't have any other anxiety. They just write what they want to write. And they write in dialect, in patois, in English, and it's authorial, and they're fine. And I think that's very exciting, uh, you know, for the four four poets, yeah. No, the, 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 the one observation I had was, was, you know, look, Walcott is to me, I, I really have a tremendous amount of, um, I respect this so, and uh, like a euf like a euphemism. But the, 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 if we talk about permission, um, we talk about setting the ground. One of the things that Kamal Brathwaite observed when he came back to the Caribbean, um, and was was starting to work on 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 um, the arrivals, was he he complained that he said, you know, what what are we going to do? Derek has written everything. All he's done the trees, he's done the water, he's done everything already. I don't have anything else to write. Um, and there's a sense in which he's done that, but. For me, I remain, and, and this is, this may be, you know, something that people would not, agree, you know, a lot of people don't agree with, but for me, what has been most interesting is watching those last sort of three major collections from um, The Bounty, uh, The Prodigal, and, and White Egrets, and seeing them as a kind of trilogy of, of a series of these wonderful elegies. Um, but, but they remind me a lot of the quartets in the, in the, in the way in which the poet is at home with the idea of, 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 of his voice, this is in Walcott's case, with, with the idea of the simplicity of the language, with the idea of not feeling that he has to, to, to use the bombast of great metaphors and so on and so forth, but also with a tremendous kind of honesty in the, in, in, in the language. In four quartets, there's one way in which you can see the vulnerability of T.S. Eliot. You can see a man, actually, who whose wife has been in a, 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 a what, do you, what do you call those places? It's an asylum, they have some, they have some nicer words for it, but, but she's been there for, for decades, right? Um, and and he, he's not on, he doesn't feel unresponsible for that, for that situation and has been accused of it. And, and he talks, of, in, in four quartets, you can see that woundedness, that sense of where do I fit into this world? And you see the, the echoes of him saying, you know, he says, this is the last poems. These are the last poems. There's a sense in which he says, this is my last testament. Now, the difference with Walcott is that every one of the books come out and he said, this is the last one, and just come out with the next one, and the next one. But what, what he's doing is that he's, he's, he's honing the language in a way that I think um, is unusual for a poet to, to be ending at such a high and fascinating level. Um, and I, I find a great deal of interesting parallels between them. Eliot turns to Christianity. Walcott, almost a kind of... Um, turns to the sea as a kind of homing, a kind of comforter, a kind of place of, 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 of ease, the last place. That, that's, that's where he locates it. But I see these two things happening in, in very interesting parallel ways and in, in really um, beautiful ways. Uh, for, for a writer like myself to see, to hear, I mean, I, this is one of the things that I, in talking to, to Derek Walcott, and he, he, said, he said, I'm trying... 
I'm still trying to, 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 to write the line of the greatest simplicity. This, this, he's still like struggling now. Like, you know, this to me is, 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 is beautiful. That's a thought that makes me feel, okay, well, it, it, it doesn't stop working on this craft, working on this craft and so on. Um, and if you read Eliot's Four Quartets as not a poem about faith, but a poem about poetry, you, you begin to see some really interesting things happening. He asks questions about the poetic impulse, why the poet is doing what the poet does, what is engaged, what are the troubles, and so on and so forth. So I see these parallels, and that's the, that was the little note that I wanted to make, that we, we are seeing that in, in the great Derek Wolf in quite remarkable ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you all very much. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear? Good afternoon. Okay, I would, this, on the program, I'm supposed to be giving the epilogue, and, um, this lecture was hard to follow <laughs> in terms of um, I don't know what kind of epilogue I can give to close off the lecture. It was so brilliant. So um, I will try my best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, I know how hard it is to come out on a Sunday afternoon when you just want to relax. For those of you that have work tomorrow, you want to relax and not think about going to work tomorrow, um, finish doing your house chores or the like. Um, I'd, like you, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank our readers who read the first two poems, Love Song of J. Alfred Pufrock and The Dust. Um, I'd also like to thank Professor Dawes, if you could give him another round of applause. Okay. Professor Dawes really pushed this lecture. He knew that he'd be in the island, and he said, you know, he really wanted to do a piece with us, and we're really grateful to him for that. Okay. Um, in my Thanksgiving, I would like to invite um, Carolyn Allen. Is she here? Yes. <laughs> to the podium. <laughs> We have a small token for you. Thank you so much for coming out and participating in the lecture this afternoon. The poem was really well read. <laughs> okay. And um, I'd also like to invite Professor Dawes back to the podium. Okay, Professor Dawes, this is your initial token. I heard there is much more to come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, as the PR officer of the National Library, I cannot be in front of a mic and not have a chance to tell you about the National Library of Jamaica. The National Library of Jamaica is Jamaica's premier research library. It is our task here at the National Library to collect, um, preserve, and facilitate access to all works published in Jamaica, by Jamaicans, or about Jamaica and we take that job very seriously here. We want to know that no matter what it is that you're studying or whatever it is you would like to know about, even just for knowledge's sake, about Jamaica, it is here. And we have works as far back as 1555, I believe, 1555, yes. <laughs> and we have modern day things as well, funeral programs, calendars, books, CDs, DVDs, music videos. And so um, as you leave, uh, have someone handing out brochures about the library. Please don't let this be the last time that I see you here at the library. I'd love to see you here on a regular basis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.